and welcome to the UAP channel. I am your host, you guessed it, UAP. That's my name, I guess. It's just three letters. Hey, it's uh, it was supposed to be like a replacement for UFO, but that ain't happening. Them shits is probably fake, right? It's like the one thing you can debunk almost. Almanac. We're going to talk about the Farmer's Almanac. Ye olde Farmer's Almanac. Yes, the Little House on the Prairie people, the pioneers, the pilgrims of ye olden times of horse and buggy and wagons and such and so forth, going out west on the Oregon Trail, Oregon Trail, Oregon Trail, the Oregon Trail. Yes, following the organs. Yes, the Westinghouse. No, were they Westinghouse? Who did it? Carnegie? Carnegie, he just... Man, he was like a guy, you know, when you hold a deck of cards and you just flip your hand, you're shooting the cards out. And he was doing that with organs, you know, like pipe organs all over the country, all over the world. Just You want to know, you, you, you got an organ over there in like St. Paul, Minnesota. Boom, I'm going to throw you one. And Jackson. I never I never heard of Jackson. I didn't know there was a town in that state named Jackson. But here you go. Here's an organ. Look out. Boom. And he's firing them off, you know. Uh, they were carried along the Oregon Trail, just like they were hauled out on ships to uh, New Zealand and Australia and everything. Anyway, we're talking about the Almanac. So you've got uh, Charles, you know, Charles from Little House on the Prairie, and and he's he's literate, right? He knows how to saw wood, and he has horse sense, and he's a good man. And he reads books at night when he smokes his pipe and smiles, that Santa Claus-style smile that is kind of a twinkle in his eye type thing that's just so quaint. And he would read two books. One book that he would read would be, of course, the Bible, the Bible, right? And, of course, he read the Bible. And then there's one other book that he would read, maybe two. Okay, so the one other book that he would read for sure would be Ye olde farmer's almanac, for it foretold the future, fortune-telling, and that type of stuff was evil sin. But then reading the farmer's, farmer's almanac, why, that's that was acceptable. That's like the Bible. It's the farmer's Bible. If you're a farmer, or you know a farmer, or everybody was farmers, and, and everybody had to know what the weather was going to be, it's climate change. And it told you in this magic book, the Farmer's Almanac, all the fanciness of it, it depicted and bespoke the mystical mysticism, the mystery of how it knew, how it knew what the future would be. And if you would talk to these uh, pioneering settlers, the people shortly after the reset, you know, who um, were probably orphans, and um, they raised orphans themselves, many of them, and they knew, one thing they knew is that you listen to the people in the top hats. You do what they say. Because if you don't, there will be trouble. An ill wind would blow into your town. And if you just stick to your Bible and stick to your farmer's almanac, you can weather the storms of life and have a little house on a prairie. Well, okay. So let's have a look at the Farmer's Almanac, the old Farmer's Almanac, or as I call it, ye oldy. And, of course, Wikipedia first, they have to just diss the whole thing and say, for other uses, see, Almanac spelled exactly the same, and then it's a disambiguation. Disambiguation. So, whatever. An Almanac, <laughs> also spelled Almanac, and Almanach is an annual publication listing a set of events forthcoming in the next year. So it's fortune telling and future telling, right? Hmm. Well, the people who were all about it, you know, they have Bible, the Bible in one hand, the farmer's almanac in the other. Oh, and I forgot to mention the the third book that they would have. I almost forgot about this. Uh, I stumbled across it today. Is uh, the Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. That book, oh man, I am 
I'm just old enough to remember when I was a teeny little kid how big of a deal it was to the really old folks who were raised by the people who were like, you know, the barefoot people with the, you know, the barefoot, like orphan. I was an orphan. I was barefoot going to school. And I had my McGuffey readers and my farmer's almanac and my Bible. You know, so you have, but then there was like, oh, well, what did you read for fun? And then they would take offense almost with a Bible is fun and, and the farmer's almanac is fun to read, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. And the McGuffey readers, well, it was school, you know. But we, we, we loved it and we would walk so far to school barefoot and blah, blah, blah. Okay, okay. But what'd you read for fun? Well, well, there was uh, Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. Now, I don't know much about it, but I'm, but I'm going to find out. Because it looks really interesting. It looks like kind of like Gulliver's Travels in a way or Dante's Inferno. I mean, it's kind of a... Yeah, I mean, it, it would be something like Dante and, and something like... I don't know. It's just what it seems like just looking at like cross between Gulliver's Travels and that. But we're talking about the Farmer's Almanac right now. And... Well, what is it according to Wikipedia, you know, and we, we're not going to look at the disambiguations. We're just going to look at the real deal. It had information like weather forecasts, future, predicting farmers' planting dates. I would have loved to know what it, what it predicted for this year because we, we had a freezing, hard, we had a hard freeze like after the last possible planting date for most years, I would think. And it has tied tables. And an interesting word, table, you know, and other tabular data often arranged according to the calendar. Celestial figures and various statistics are found in almanacs. So it's basically your astrolabe, such as the rising and setting times of the sun, the moon, dates of eclipses, hours of high and low tides. Well, they already said that, tide tables, and religious festivals. Pagan festivals. No, not that. Maybe that. The set events noted in an almanac may be tailored for a specific group of readers, such as farmers, sailors, or astronomers, misnomers, astronomers, astronomers, and astronauts, whatever. I don't know. Whatever Wikipedia. <laughs> Whoever wrote this, did they really know? Did they ever know an astronomer? actually uses the almanac <laughs> give me a break I mean we have Michelle Fowler a so called astronomer who proudly states that she never once owned a personally owned a telescope or used her own personal telescope ever ever like what <laughs> it's like it's like being an automotive engineer and not knowing like not ever changing your own oil or something but it happens trust me that does happen it's crazy I just don't get it Fundamentals, folks. Fundamentals. You know, look up and look like a fool. I guess it works. They promote, you know, incompetence a lot of times. That's how it was in the corporate world. Um. So, okay, so we're going to look. We'll go on here. Etymology. And I love etymology, especially now more than ever, because you really get the root of the matter, and you find out, uh, where this stuff comes from. And the spelling is very important because of the spelling disambiguations in the sense of <laughs> different meaning of the word, right? So etymology of the word is unclear. Hmm. So like the number two book or maybe number three book in the world for a century, the etymology of the title of the book, the name of the book or the classification of it is unclear. It has been suggested that the word almanac derives from a Greek word meaning calendar. Whatever has been suggested, okay. I suggest that you're wrong. <laughs> However, that word appears only once in antiquity by Eusebius, who quotes Porphyry as to the Coptic Egyptian use of astrological charts. Almanikiaka. The earliest almanacs were calendars that included agricultural, astronomical, or meteorological data. Meteor meteorological data. Meteorological. Yeah, yeah. But it's highly unlikely that Roger Bacon 
is he supposed to be um, Bill Shakespeare as well? I don't know. We, it's highly unlikely that Roger Bacon received the word from this etymology. Hmm. Notwithstanding the suggestive sound and use of this word, of which, however, the real form is very uncertain, the difficulties of connecting it historically, either with the Spanish Arabic manaka or with medieval Latin almanach, without Arabic intermediation, seem insurmountable. Now, if you could follow that sentence, I would like to give you a gold star because that was just a run-on sentence. Good job, Bill Shakespeare, Roger Bacon, whoever you are. Uh, it's just what they said. Oh, I don't know what the where the word comes from. It's probably not any of these things where it might have come from. The earliest documented use of the word in any language is in Latin in 1267 by Roger Bacon. Oh, Roger Bacon. I was thinking of some. I was thinking of Sir Francis Bacon. I'm sorry. There's Kevin Bacon. You got Roger Bacon, Sir Francis Bacon, all kinds. You know, thick cut bacon and maple bacon and all kinds of different bacon's. Okay, whatever. Where it meant a set of tables detailing movements of heavenly boudets, including the moon. So it's like the book form of the astrolabe. Hmm. The that's how I see it, but that's not what this says. This is Wikipedia. So, One etymology report says the ultimate source of the word is obscure. Its first syllable, al, as in algorithm, and its general, or from, I think is from in uh, Arabic, is what that is, and its general relevance to medieval science and technology. Oh, my. I mean, this is amazing because I almost never ever hear an admission or read any reference to anything about that thousand year period or so as to any kind of reference or that there could possibly be a relevance to such a thing as medieval science or medieval technology because the dark ages were somewhat evil. They were medieval. <laughs> um, I'm joking about that. But but. I'm serious about the sense of it that they they just the the official narrative is that the medieval times were backward and dark and there was hardly any advancement at all. It's just like it's made up, like nothing happened type thing. It doesn't it doesn't fit human progress that we see. So it's. Um, so this would strongly suggest an Arabic origin, but no convincing candidate has been found. Ernest, Ernest Weekly similarly states of Almanac, first seen in Roger Bacon. Apparently, okay, this is repeating the same thing. All right, let's skip over this. Walter William W W thirty three Walter White. Uh, you know, Walt Whitman, Walter William Skeet concludes that the construction of an Arabic origin is not satisfactory. The Oxford English Dictionary similarly says the word has no etymon in Arabic, but indirect circumstantial evidence points to a Spanish Arabic almanach. Ooh. So we're wrapping it back around with Spanish Arabic. The reason why the proposed Arabic word is speculatively spelled almanac is that the spelling occurred as almanac as well as almanac. And Roger Bacon himself used both spellings, so let's toss out what we said earlier. The earliest use of the word was in the context of astronomy calendars. Well, didn't we start off? Let's go back. I just, this kind of stuff just ticks me off. The word has been suggested that the word almanac derives from the Greek word meaning calendar. However, that word only appears once in antiquity by Eusebius. So the very first thing, why did they use the word however? I mean, it's confusing. It's Because I tossed that out, you know, right off the bat. But it makes sense, you know. And it's funny that they mentioned Coptic, Egyptian, astrological. Because in apocryphal uh, scriptures, there's reference to was it Abram or Moses? One of those two dudes. Uh, it was Abram, Abraham. 
Yeah. Yeah, it was Abraham. He went to Egypt, right, and with Sarah, and then um, he said Sarah was his sister, and the Pharaoh or somebody high up wanted to bang her, and then he's like, oh, they're all freaking out because they were married, and and he didn't want the Pharaoh to, to have her, and then he admitted that to the Pharaoh that he lied about her being his sister, that they were doing the, the deed or whatever together, uh, you know, happily, whatever, married, um, even though they didn't have any children yet. And and then the Pharaoh was actually a cool dude. He's like, oh, dude, I'm sorry, man. I, wish, I, I'm, I wouldn't have done that if I hadn't known. Hey, you know, and then they got along. They were bros. And uh, Abram was like all about like, hey, like I talked to God, <laughs> by the way, and... So I know all this crap. I know tons of crap about like the stars and stuff. Like someday it might be called astrology. And I can help you predict stuff. Predict stuff. Okay. You want to learn? I'll teach you. And then so they, he like did a little, little workshop school or whatever over there and taught them all this stuff about astrology. And that is what possibly led to the three wise men being able to look at the stars and tell what the heck's going on and go down to... Uh, Bethlehem or wherever, you know, wherever they met. Uh, yeah, it was Bethlehem. Meet uh, Jesus. So, three wise men, they were astrologers, right? So, so it's this science. It's a science. It's not, they didn't act like it wasn't anything other than an actual, it was a big time important science. And it's a big deal. They knew it so well, like we don't have an appreciation for it. The only way you could have an appreciation for how well they knew the movements of those little lights in the sky, is if you think of it this way. They slept, it's hot in the desert, you know, they slept on the rooftops, right, a lot of times, in the homes, and they traveled at night a lot of times because of the heat, and the stars are quite visible, brilliantly visible, and there's not much else to look at. Giant screen in the sky, you know, you're looking at that. And they, ever since they were babies, they're looking at these stars, okay? They didn't, they, they didn't have fake ball planets spinning around in cribs inside, you know, uh, getting shots and no vitamin D from the sun. They had, they had plenty of good sunlight and then they, they just, they saw the real deal. And so they really knew that. Plus they were from a culture of every, everybody around them practically spent, countless nights on their backs looking up at the stars trying to fall asleep you know it's bedtime you got stuff to do in the morning but you don't feel like falling asleep and they're watching the stars they could tell the time easily they could tell the season so easily they could navigate so easily probably without even talking about it they just it's like it's like landmarks it's like how do you know your way around your house how do you know your way around your your desktop screen or whatever you use you know it's something you look at all the freaking time uh, but but the thing is your home changes your computer screen changes unfortunately with updates and things like that but the sky you know it just runs in this pattern and then there are some you know the wandering stars the deviating um, the deviating um, placements that go on and and so they could trace backward and forward in time. And then to trace very far forward in time, they made a computer called the Astrolabe, which is an analog, ingenious, elegant, beautiful computer that they had as students, like education. You know, they had um, they had this thing that was... Uh, present in in their learning process they had pocket versions that are pretty rare to find but they're out there as uh, antiques ancient things uh no bigger than like well okay bigger than a watch like a pocket watch but not much bigger than a pocket watch and with that they could do somewhere between 500 and a thousand calculations and it's analog it's just by excuse me for a second yes it's but by spinning the wheels of it and marking, knowing what day it is, and then you mark the position of the sun, and, you know, the stars, 
there are different things you can do with it, but um, I think it's a conservative estimate to say that there are a thousand um, functions or uses, features of it, uh, that you can divine from the various symbols and markings as they are laid out in the various like myriad of combinations. Okay. And it's extremely accurate. I mean, it's almost, it's pretty much perfectly accurate. So they, they had that. They had the astrolabe a long time ago. And I, I believe that they had the sextant and the compass as well. Although I'm not so, sh- I'm not so sure that they even needed a compass. Just like they didn't need GPS. I mean, when you really, really, really know the um, stars and your local time, okay, and if you can relate it back to the local time elsewhere, you can get your latitude and longitude exactly. Um, The thing about doing that at sea that was difficult was having an accurate time piece because that is way easier to do on land than it is to do at sea to compare times and or a line of communication. But they may have had that too. They may have had radio or some other kind of uh, instant or near instant long distance communication. And I, I know it's not written about much, but I'm not going to say it's impossible. But just to give you an idea of the advancement of these um, Arabic or Persian um, or Middle Eastern in general, ancient cultures from the time. But the science of astrology, as far as I've learned so far, as I'm looking into it, came originally through from like God himself too, or maybe the ancestors of Abram, Abraham, you know, that old chestnut. But the Egyptians are, are the ones known pretty well for it. But uh, apparently, you know, it may just be a story, right? But apparently, according to this one source that I read, it was um, it was uh, Abram or Abraham that, that brought it there. Now, it could have been Joshua, because Joshua was in Egypt, and he was made number two. Your stock is rising, number two, you know. But I don't think it was him. I mean, he may have also done some of that, but I think the tradition came from Abraham. So, okay. All right. And and probably Noah knew a lot of that anyway. So a lot of the cultures all over the earth have an astrological science tradition going way back. And, you know, my whole approach to it, I've said it before. I'll say it again. I'm saying it now. My whole approach to astrology is this. The globe was given to us by astronomy. Astronomy is supposed to be the like a high science and just like the flat earth is laughable, uh, astrology is laughable to the astronomy crowd who we know are prevaricators or sadly mistaken in almost every possible sense, which would lead one to believe the the uh, disdain that they have for astrology is probably because it's a threat to their worldview, which is based on lies. And astrology is probably based on a lot of truth and should be given an honest look. And and then my original reaction, you know, comes from like basic programming from society, like, oh, well, it's like bad or evil or whatever. And... Uh, I didn't find that to be the case as I looked into it. Um, Augustine and others were extremely well-versed in astrology, and though the term itself was oftentimes used as a derogative of the science, as they refer to it, when that was done, it was with reference to like the bad apples or the bad actors or the examples of the misuse of it but uh, there were certainly fundamental truths and a basic science to it. Like, just like today with rocket science, you know, a lot of the science that you learn, like in the periphery of all that, is good. I mean, some of the people who 
spend their lives building widgets and things for fake rockets and things like that. They, it's good science. They're good engineers. They did well in school and they know, you know, they, they just don't know that it's going on a balloon or it's just not going to be used because it's redundant to ground-based systems. And, you know, well, it's not, that's not their fault. But it gets it gives a bad rap, you know. I could see how, like, five hundred years from now, that there would be a general disdain, like, oh, science or rocket science, you know, it's got to be bad or evil, <laughs> uh, you know. Once the truth of all the fraud comes out about it, well, yeah, that's I can see that happening. But um, it, I being in it now myself, I would say it doesn't mean that the people or the uh, fundamentals of the science that goes into what is ultimately used for evil or fake or deception, that, you know, that outcome doesn't mean that the inputs are all bad. But some of the inputs are very bad. So, yeah, yeah. So, astrology. Hmm. So, the almanac has a lot to do with astrology. A lot. Especially in, the, in its foundation. So, etymology. So, we're pretty much through that. So, okay. Then I started looking at the prestige of the tables of Toledo and other medieval Arabic astronomy works at the time of the world's, of, of the word's emergence in the West together with the absence of the word in Arabic. I don't think there, I don't agree that there was an absence of the word in Arabic. I think it may have been scrubbed from the record. But anyway, it suggests it may have been invented in the West and is pseudo-Arabic. Well, I don't at that time, in the West, it would have been prestigious to attach an Arabic appellation to a set of astronomical tables. Well, yeah. Also around that time, prompted by that motive, the Latin writer Pseudo-Geber, <laughs> he's not the real Geber, he's Pseudo-Geber, he wrote under an Arabic pseudonym. Okay. The latter alchemical word, alchest, is known to be pseudo-Arabic. All right, so now we're talking about alchemy. So now that's something else, all right? So where uh, uh, astrology gets a bad rap, alchemy probably doesn't get a bad enough rap, in my opinion. From what I've learned more recently, um, not that it would be necessarily an impossible or an actual pseudoscience. There may be some real science to it that works, or perhaps magic, you know, um, whatever the case, there's something to it, probably, it's not just folly or fancy, but it may be a lost art, or maybe it's not a lost art, and we just aren't aware of it being used today. And that, I think the latter is most likely to be true, although it's so well hidden, we may never really know, but we know who the, the uh, masters of alchemy are. And we see their work. We, we see their handiwork and the strange things that we can't explain. Okay, so, like Bitcoin, <laughs> that'd be an example. I mean, that's kind of a, a light-hearted, um, tongue-in-cheek example, but kind of a good example, although, of the fundamental sense of what alchemy does or seeks to do, supposedly, as a science or pseudoscience wait but uh clearly at that at that point the the whole thing is getting a little bit uh rewritten as it were or recast into different things so uh where we're at today it's so far gone we have to really parse it to try to figure anything out about what the origins are of the farmer's almanac and so they talk about the history hemorrhologies and parapigmata. So the earlier texts considered to be almanacs have been found in the Near East dating back to the middle of the second millennium BC. They have been called generally hemorrhologies from the Greek hemera, hemorrhologies, okay, meaning day. Among them is so called is the the so called Babylonian almanac, which lists favorable and unfavorable days with advice on what to do on each of them. So it's uh, astrological science, right? But, you know, Babylonian, so uh, 
yes, it, that's got kind of a red flag to it, but the science part of it is probably solid, very solid. The Toledo in Tables... The Toledo in Tables of Toledo, Ohio, or Tables of Toledo, Ohio, no, not Ohio, Spain, were astronomical tables which were used to predict the movements of the sun, moon, and planets relative to the fixed stars. So it's kind of like the astrolabe in table format. Probably some teacher did it just to mix things up, make students work harder. But teacher, why can't we just use our astrolabe? Why, you know, why can't we just use the computer? Why should we have to hand calculate on and work through these funky tables to find the same information we can just get by spinning the disks on our awesome computer that doesn't even have batteries. It just works. We, my mom had to buy it for this class, you know, for Texas Instruments. Whatever. They were completed around year 1080 by a group, and it's around 1080, yeah, 10, 1075 maybe, maybe 1082, we don't know, by a group of Arabic astronomers at Toledo, Spain. They had started as pre-existing Arabic tables made elsewhere. So, la di da why didn't they just use those? Well, they were numerically adjusted to be centered on the location of Toledo, or Toledo, to pronounce it properly. In modern English astronomy, tables of movements of astronomical boudets are called ephemerides. 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 I don't know. The tables of Toledo were partly based on the work of Al Zarkali, known to the West as Arzachel. Achel. It's like Rachel? No. Arzachel. 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 Something like that. An Arab mathematician, astronomer, astronomy instrument maker, and astrologer hmm, who lived in Toledo. He was probably considered himself a a mathematician a little bit and an instrument maker and an astrologer and then they his stuff was really good and so then they put the astronomer astronomy stuff on it which if he was good he wouldn't have really wanted that because that stuff's bunk bullcrap the tables were produced by a team whose membership is largely unknown with the exception of R. Zarkali Toledo Toledo came under Christian Spanish rule in the mid-1080s, shortly after the tables were completed. A century later at Toledo, the Arabic to Latin translator Gerard of Cremona translated for Latin readers the tables. Okay, cool. So here's the interesting part. Um, okay, so then they got redone again in 1270. Oh, again. And translated from Spanish Latin from the original tables of two centuries earlier. The descendants of the Toledo and tables is updated with some corrections, really, were the most widely used astronomy tables in the late medieval Latin in late medieval Latin astronomy. Well, the corrections were probably from errors in recentering the meridian. Although the compilers of the tables assumed the Earth was stationary and the center of the universe, the data in the tables was successfully used by Copernicus in the development of the model in which the sun is stationary. <laughs> okay, if I had a detonator of TNT, I would plunge that plunger down and listen to the explosions going off and the entirety of the, the whole hillside crumble of the quarry or whatever it is I'm blowing up because that is a bomb. A bomb for anybody who believes in the heliocentric model. Look, the origin of the heliocentrics uh, claim of predictability of astrological or astronomical bodies and movements. It's all based on these tables, the Toledo tables, slightly bastardized by translations from probably perfection, what they started with, which is just a table version of the astrolabe. Okay. That is all what Copernicus just kind of co-opted and made this wild, baseless assumption 
of a new model which just interprets the same data that was working already, just reinterprets it in light of this ridiculous guess or fantasy that the sun is stationary. Okay. All right, well, whatever floats your boat, 500 years later, we're still dealing with this bull crap. You know? But whatever cops, Copernicus. All right. So they mentioned the word hemorologies, and so I looked that up, and there was no definition. Huh. And then I looked it up again, and it just took us back to... Uh, I think it just pulled up like almanac. Like, wait, that's just what it's describing. Just like, what's the definition of it? And so I had to go to the web and I looked and then I found um, that it is a... So the first definition, um, they just say, oh, a mock hemorology in which the dietary prescriptions of typical of hemorologies are ridiculed with coarse humor. In other words, they're just they're just lambasting it like they do the flat earth or bloodletting or anything else that actually, you know, kind of works. Um, no, that has to be replaced with ridiculous stuff like pharmaceuticals and whatever things that don't really work usually. Okay. Coarse humor. Oh, flat earth. Oh. And all the insults and things, and coarse humor, ridicule. So, don't you eat, you eat donkeys' buttocks and dog shit and blue bottles excrement and uh, stupid. So you know that hemorology, there must be something to it. You know, when the number one result, just like when you type in flat earth on YouTube, and the number one result and the number one through ten results are all doing that, they're just making it seem so stupid, making fun of it, flat ethics. So the number two definition, it's a little bit more, uh, a little bit more respectable. The term hemorology denotes the cultural practice, an entire culture did this for how many years, guys? So who's the dummy? Of connecting the success or failure of actions with favorable or unfavorable days defined by the calendar a different calendar than what we have, mind you, uh, the, but the calendar, the astrological calendar that's logical, you know, the logical part of it. The assumption that days are fixed not only quantitatively, but also qualitatively, that was common to all ancient cultures and led to its own genre, the hemorologian. Hemor, hemorologian. So it's this entire science. It's like medicine, okay? It's like that big in these ancient cultures. And it was very much uh, very much proven out through time. And it is cause and effect over a long period of time. That means that you have verification, you have repetition, you have validation, you have observation. It has all the hallmarks of real science, observable repeatable, reproducible. And I like, especially, that it calls out the measurements both quantitatively and qualitatively, okay? It's very, very scientific. And then you have also, not just reproducible, but you have all cultures, all ancient cultures did this. So that means it comes from like Noah, and so it's very, very solid, very, very solid and should be uh, brought back into practice, in my estimation. Take it for what it's worth. So when they diss it and they refuse to even define the word, except to say uh, astrology or to say uh, from it simply going back to the word almanac, you know, that that's simply that's simply the a cop out, you know, so that there's this, there's this, uh, no content found when I try to look it up. So, okay. 
So let's just move on. So the almanac, okay, so the word, uh, yeah, okay, the word parapigmata, I looked that up, and they have a definition, but it's almanac. <laughs> so that doesn't do us much good. We already knew that. So I had to go and find it somewhere, and I found it in a couple places, and uh, I have to use even fair use on this definition because the only place, like none of the free dictionaries for like the public domain that I could find, they had none of them seem to have a decent definition. So, parapegma, parapegma, parapegmata, parapegmas, device for keeping track of cyclical events, particularly of stars, weather, seasons, and so on. Do you know what that is? That is an astrolabe, folks. None of the definitions said astrolabe, as far as I could see, right? Uh, parapeng, parapeng, parapem, I don't know how to pronounce it, whatever. Um, an engraved tablet, usually of brass, set up in a public place. So kind of, kind of like a sundial type thing, maybe. But parapems were used for publication of laws, proclamations, and the recording of astronomical phenomena or calendar events, recording of. So not really predicting, in this case, uh, recording of. But in the other definition, it was, yes, recording of, keeping track of cyclical events. But cyclical, that would imply prediction, which would then be the analog computer, the calculator, the astrolabe, which is similar to a table, or as people do it now with uh, computer programs that are just so... <laughs> not going to last, you know, these star tracker programs that Neil deGrasse Tyson uses or refers to, that he has no idea how they work, uh, how they were programmed, and they seem to predict really well when they project these little light beams, if it's properly calibrated, uh, with the center projector on the dome over the flat floor of the, <laughs> of the planetarium, which looks exactly like the dome at the beginning of the Superman you know, series on Krypton, you know, like in so many other places, it's just it's the, the dome, you know, it's the dome, the thing that they laugh at. That's what they use to uh, visualize the... Um, and, and it works better to visualize it that way, like at a planetarium. It really does because your personal vision dome, that's what you experience. And when you're looking at a flat computer screen with the stars, it actually doesn't work as well. But... I like to use these programs like, uh, I don't know what's called, like Sky Tracker, Star Tracker, whatever, these apps. I actually, I buy them. I pay the money for them, yes. And then um, you can just move your phone or tablet around. And if you have a good motion sensor and good compass, and it's, you calibrate it sometimes, calibrate it, and you just lift it, move it around. And my neighbors might think I'm crazy until I tell them what I'm doing. <laughs> they know by now. And I'm looking for, you know, objects and things. Like the comets, though, they're not on there. So I had to do, like, harder work to try to find those. But it's just been cloudy all the time, so I haven't been able to spot it with my P-1000 yet. But there's always a couple comets somewhere. Um, not always visible, at least in these latitudes. Anyway, so we got that defined. Um, so uh, we talked about the good and bad days... And the Egyptians, uh, so, okay. So the Babylonian almanac lists favorable and unfavorable days with advice on what to do on each of them. Now, with astrology, of course, that would depend on your own personal um, sign or placements. What's your sign, baby? And that type of thing. So successive variants and versions aimed at different readership have been found. So it's a, it's a complex science, really. Egyptian lists of good and bad moments three times each day have also been found. That's interesting. Many of these prognostics were connected with celestial events. The flooding of the Nile Valley, a most important event in ancient Egypt, was expected to occur at the summer solstice, but as the civil calendar had exactly 365 days over the centuries, the date was drifting in the calendar. Well, that, see, the, the example that they give, is probably not even a correct thing. That's probably false. Because the whole point of the whole thing, of it being a complex science, it wouldn't be so freaking easy to say, duh, the flooding's gonna happen on the summer solstice. 
and the summer solstice isn't depending on the calendar days because the summer solstice is a celestial event that you see in the sky regardless of the day. You can tell when it is. So the date wouldn't be drifting on the calendar. Well, the, the day, if you want to keep the day number the same, that's drifting, but they were smart enough to know that. So that I just, I tossed that. That kind of bullcrap ticks me off so bad when they put that in there and they try to make it seem like our ancestors were stupid. Stupider than we are, you know? <laughs> the first heliacal rising of Sirius. Let's get Sirius. Was used for its prediction in this practice, the observation of some star, just some star, and it's connecting to some event, just some event apparently spread. So they make it sound like a total crap pseudoscience by saying it that way. Yet the Greek almanac, known as the Perpegma, has existed in the form of an inscribed stone on which the days of the month are indicated. So it was written in stone, literally. So, okay, let's get back to talking about the almanac. Ye olde farmer's almanac. Oh, now you hear me say, everything seems to have started around 1850, right? Well, the ye olde farmer's almanac they say it was around long before that. And it probably was, but we're not going to really see that, are we? Uh, I don't know. In 1804, the monthly illustrations changed from the rule to the heavenly. So they have it backwards, I think. Because I think it was the other way. Pictorials representing the constellations and the 12 signs of the zodiac appear for each month, of course. Really? Each month? Because it doesn't really follow the months exactly, does it? They are borderless unsigned wood engravings that repeat along with the series frontispiece through 1808 when the shit started to hit the fan. Interestingly, for the month of August, the engraver has depicted Virgo, the Virgin, and as Ceres, or perhaps her daughter. Hmm. As Ceres, or perhaps her daughter. The grain goddess holding a sickle for harvest and a bundle of wheat. Spica, the name of Virgo's brightest star, comes from the Latin word meaning ear of grain. So, 1808, people going to die. It's a big reset. Shit hits the fan. And there you have uh, the harvest, you know. January 1804, calendar cut shows Aquarius the water bearer. Yep, okay. In 1809, Robert B. Thomas, with no editorial explanation whatsoever. I put the word really cleaned house as we have seen Alexander Anderson's Mr. Anderson. Alexander Anderson's father time first appears on the title page in the in this year and the 12 signs of the Zodiac have been re-engraved anonymously within ovals surrounded blah blah blah. In 1809 Robert B. Tom... Okay, wait, we just read that. So there's the oval decorative floral borders Father Time, hanging out. What's he got there? Is that... Can I see that? I can't zoom in. Has he got like a Gatling gun or fashes? Or like a mechanical arm? Or what is that thing in front of him? No, his arm's up. Uh, uh, was it like a, like a hover scooter or something? I don't know. Different renderings of the 12 zodiacs continue to be used at the top of the right-hand calendar pages up until the present time. Along the way... Remakes of the designs shows show up, most notably in 1819, the same year that Abel Bowen re-engraved Father Time frontispiece. Yes, the Zodiac engravings, although unsigned, strongly resemble Bowen's style. Hint, hint, I guess. And again, okay, here we are, in 1853, when Hamat Billings and Henry Nichols collaborated on both the Father Time frontispiece and the Zodiac ovals. It's my It's my contention that up until 1853 that those were recreations of what they wanted you to think that they were. That's my contention. I think that what we find now is only what they wanted us to ever see. The complete bastardization and remake of it in 1853, just like everything else, even the, the, the aired opful, the globe, the original globe of 1492, when people first started to think that the Earth could be a globe because Columbus sailed the ocean blue and they didn't know that could be done. That was redone. The globe was redone, I think, in the 1850s or 1860s, maybe 1880s, but that, that aired out full. They don't even know if it's the original one, actually, because it was either a replica, a remake, 
from after 1850, or it was a, a such of a repair as to be like practically a new thing. So, so the globe itself, I think, is only from 1850, like the the, the oldest globes that you can see in a museum, pretty much. I mean, it was it was so so much refurbished that it was like if it were anything else, it would be declared worthless. You know, like you you refinish a a chair, an antique chair, and it's worthless. You know, oh, you refinished it, it's worthless. It looks better, but it's worthless because it's not the original. But you refinish the aired opful with so many parts that it's just unrecognizable from the original. Ah, well, that's fine. It's the original. Okay, so in 1979, the Zodiac engravings were replaced the, the sign. Well, we don't care. All right. So, okay. In 2000, the art was changed to the engraving renderings we use today. There are engravings depicting each of the 12 months that originally appeared in the 1854 edition of Gleason's Gleason Pictorial. You know, Gleason's map? <laughs> Gleason's Pictorial Drawing Room Companion, published in Boston. We have been using these charming engravings ever since. So, when was it even called the Almanac? Well, let's go back. Let's Or not go back, but let's look at this. So the wood engravings on the front covers, 1840s, sheaf of wheat, all important agricultural prosperity, father time, da da da, animals, rural winter scene, plowman, milkmaid, five geese laying, whatever the heck. Okay, ten geese laying. The wheat cut is the only one that contains the engraver's initial capital H. It probably stands for Alonso Hartwell. Whatever whose full last name appears in the advertising cut on the back cover of an 1851 almanac. Hartwell was a pupil of Boston wood engraver Abel Bowen. Right. Two mid-century publications may have prompted the OFA, Old Farmer's Almanac, or YOFA, Y-O-F-A, Ye Oldie Farmer's Almanac, to create its own full-page standardized front cover, The Four Seasons, with portraits of Benjamin Franklin, Ha, Hoax, Coding, and Robert B. Thomas that came into use in 1851 and has appeared ever since. In other words, the first old Farmer's Almanac with a full-page standardized front cover, as we know it today, came into use in 1851. So it could be. It could be that the other ones were recreations, right? Because you go older than this, you don't see the same thing. It's just sheets of paper and different things like assumed in a lot of cases, in my opinion, from what I've seen so far. All right. Two mid-century publications have may have prompted the old farmer's almanac to create some full page. Uh, okay, I just read that. Sorry. But here's the picture. Okay. Ye olde farmer's almanac by Robert B. Thomas, Gladding and Brothers, Providence, Rhode Island, 1851 period. Okay. Hmm. All right. But it kind of fit, fits into this idea, too, of, you know, like the I and the J stuff, where you get back in time and you get into the 1700s and especially the 16th, you don't see the numbers. You don't see the number one out there. It's an I or a J. You know, it's got the thousand missing thousand years. Like here it is, Ye Oldie Farmer's Almanac, number 59. Number 58 didn't have a front cover. <coughs> so, and it supposedly was around for, you know, hundreds of years before that in various forms, but you just don't see them. They don't see them. What, the printing press was invented in 1850? No. It's supposed to be hundreds, it's supposed to be a long time before that. All right. So that, that pretty much covers it, but you can tell, yes, I'm getting into the different uh, topics here. I'm talking about uh, the prediction. Now, we're, I want to get a better look, a deeper look into the Farmer's Almanac because I have some theories about how the predictions are made. And they are astrological in nature and perhaps astronomical, but I'm going to, if they want to diss, if if the powers that be that created the likes of Michelle Fowler and Neil deGrasse Tyson and, and Bill Nye, if they want to diss astrology and promote astronomy, then I'm going to ascribe astronomy as complete bunk, worthless, and put the value on the astrology, period, going forward, because, look, the predictive tables, they were made from astrological 
charts and machines or algorithms, almanacs, okay? Programs, computer programs from a more elegant age. And the lightsaber of all this was the astrolabe. And the almanac is just a book version of it. You know, it's like the astrolabe for dummies type thing. Although, you know, it makes probably some more specific astrological predictions and things. Well, it spells it out in a cryptic way. And it's got this air of mystery about it. And why is that? Because the the answer of the mystery is, it's an ancient science and it's astrological in origin and in nature. And it is scientific and it does predict things. And it does so by various humors and qualities of celestial bodies and proximities based on a uh, geocentric model. Now, it, not necessarily a flat Earth, okay, but a geocentric stationary Earth at least, not the heliocentric model, and certainly not with the distances that uh, are reported to us by the pseudoscience of astronomy. No, we're talking about real science. We're talking about astrology where you have cause and effect, and it is something traced and trackable, and I don't, haven't looked, but I'm sure that there is a dearth or a a, um, a lack of studies with respect to double-blind, placebo-controlled experiments of astrological predictions based on proper, proper, uh, well-accepted, ancient, practiced astrology. Astrology, like, well, what was the word? Heck. You know, it's so new to me, I have to go back and look um, what the word was for it. Humorologies and parapigmata. You know, that stuff. You know, that three times a day, good and bad moments, things like that, you know. A lot of people have a sense of this stuff. It's like, okay, you know, they could tell, like, I had a feeling something bad would happen or whatever. And then I'll, so many times it gets written off as superstition, but I think it should really be looked into because uh, the likes of St. Augustine, for example, one of the fathers of the Christian church, certainly did not dismiss um, these types of things. He Rather, he openly spoke about the undeniable scientific relevance of such um observations or predictions and the fact that they were neutral as far as uh, moral integrity goes um, he was he was defining the difference between that and it was the misuse of it and the overstatement of it in replacing God's will or God's design for your life that made it um, demonology or whatever. It was... Um, astrology did not equal demonology, but the word in... The, I think maybe it was the King James Bible or maybe some others that kind of uh, blurs the lines or uses the terms interchangeably or at least the definitions through perhaps inference or implication to suggest such a correlative, but I really don't think it was there, especially the more I read from the early church fathers and the orthodox teachings that they set forth based on the knowledge that they had in the century or two or three after the time of Christ, which may not have been that long ago, folks. <laughs> like, maybe not all that long ago. All right, so we've gone for over an hour. Now, I hope you enjoyed... Um, it's a fascinating topic. I'm going to be hitting on it a lot more. It seems uh, to be something, you know, we've we've spent a lot of time on this channel figuring out and making fun of the stupidity and the ridiculousness of what is held up as high science, you know, the, the nonsense spouted off these days by Bill Nye and all them whoever the heck they have out there. It's just getting crazier and crazier. Well, 
you know, after a while, it's like, okay, it's a distraction. Distraction from what? It's a replacement. It's, it's a counterfeit. A counterfeit of what? What's a value? What can we use? What can we actually employ? What, what is it that, you know, how, how are they the elite? You know, what are they doing? How did they get there? What, you know, it's divine, you know, divine providence. Well, maybe, but it's probably, uh, to some extent, a, um, an employment or a uh, practice of various arts. Now, if they're dark arts, of course, we don't want to do that because what should it profit to gain a man the whole world but lose his soul? Yet, um, the fundamental facts of science wouldn't be something that you couldn't have knowledge of or use to your advantage if they are neutral and are just tools that could be either good or bad now um you know so so i want to look into it carefully and respectively respectably um and also disrespectively i don't mind dissing the nonsense and waste of time that official mainstream science oftentimes is when it's provably false and um, I'm not worried about being um, uh, criticized for for saying that because if something is provably false, it's provably false. I mean, let's we're all in this together. Let's not uh, waste our time with things that we know are worthless. Like, like what Europa has at its core. This tiny light in the sky that we can barely see going around uh, Jupiter. The moon Europa. They made a movie about it. And it's <laughs> the very definition of pseudoscience. You know, it's like, okay, how can it even be considered science? It's just fantasy. You know, that light up there is a rock and that rock is ice and that ice has a core. And in that core is, a, is life. And it's named after a continent on Earth, Europa, which would you know, really be should be part of Asia, like one continent. But whatever, that's another story. Okay, I'm getting off topic. Let's go. And uh, yeah, do another video, hey. But I'll see you then, because it won't be just yet. I a uh, little few show notes before I go. Um, I pub or I I made a video. I put it on the backup channel. Uh, which is UAP channel. Okay. And that is HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash YouTube dot com forward slash C forward slash UAP C-H-A-N-N-E-L. Okay. That's the channel. And uh, it's a f great little video, um, but it was blocked. And so hopefully it gets unblocked in due time and I will publish it and it's awesome. Okay. So I've mentioned it, uh, so you can look for that, but, uh, sorry about the dearth of videos. Word of the day, dearth, D-E-A-R-T-H. It's not to be confused with Darth Vader. It's dearth. Dearth means a lack of, okay. So there has been a dearth of videos, but I'm getting rolling again. And I'm glad you're with me. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.